how do you make the leap from single family to multifamily? Or you have um, slowly over many years built a portfolio of single family assets and what do you do now? How do you get into multifamily real estate? It's all about cash flow and really managing your time and return. And so that's a lot of folks from the single family portfolio and investing side say, you know, they're spending a bunch of time overseeing these individual houses around the city or around the country, and they're getting too many inquiries, too many tenant requests, and scaling up to have 100 units under one roof is going to be a much better use of their time as opposed to having 100 individual homes um, in their neighborhood or around the country. And so it's, it's a leap that we've seen a lot of people do. It's also another strategy. We've got several investors of ours who had large single family portfolios. And just over the last few years, they've sold off a good portion of those properties and just passively invested that equity into the deal, into our deals, because they're able to have freedom of their time and um, be out there with income and investments in multifamily, but not actively having to manage and oversee it. So it, again, it's a good balance of what you're trying to do. Um, with today's webinar, I'm going to focus on a few different topics, and uh, those are going to be the multifamily investment types, understanding your goals, getting started with your first investment, and then level of effort that's required. Because again, a lot of the components here of making the leap from single to multifamily is all about controlling your time and having more of it to do the things that you enjoy to do. With that being said, use the chat box, use the Q&A box. This is meant to be interactive. So if you have questions that come up, ask them throughout and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, number one, for the conversation today, the different types of multifamily investments. There are um, a, a different kind of terminology set that's used within the industry. And so one of the things that you may hear is, you know, what property type is a multifamily property? Is it a type A? Is it a type B? Is it a type C? Or is it a type D? It's a a pretty common, um, you know, rating scale that investors and brokers and owners use. And it's, it really comes down to the vintage of the property and what year the property was built. So if you have a property that was built in the 1960s or 70s or older, and again, this is just a rule of thumb. It's not a hard and fast um, rule, but just kind of industry speak, um, a, a D type property is going to be one that's pretty old. So, you know, usually it's built before 1970. A C property might be one that is built between the 70s and 80s. A B property is probably one that was built in the 90s or in the early 2000s. And an A property is something that's probably built within the last five years or so. And in addition to that, sometimes when properties are renovated, um, you would use that renovated year if they did a full renovation of a property to bring it up. Maybe you bought a 1980s property that was a B asset and you spend a bunch of money to renovate the interior and the exterior, and it's pretty much brand new, that property could be called an A property. Um, again, it's kind of based on the location of it. It's based on the vintage of it. And um, as you're getting into the space, have conversations with the real estate broker about you know, different areas in the markets that you're looking at and the different property types that there are based on the year properties were built or the year they were renovated in. And that's going to really give you a good feel for 
the types of multifamily investments that are out there. In addition to the type of the actual property, there's also, you know, different nuances um, around a market. So, you know, you may have a, um, a property type that's in a very downtown urban area. Uh, maybe it's like a high rise type of property. You would, you would call that a, a mid rise or a high rise if it has maybe interior elevators to it versus if you have a suburban area um, out in a neighborhood with, you know, some strip plazas and good school district um, and a lot more space, you may have garden style apartments where typically they are one, two, or at most three floors up and you would have staircases to access the units as opposed to having elevators in a more concentrated um, downtown type of market. So garden style apartments, mid-rise style apartments, high-rise style of apartments. Um, there's also a new type that's kind of becoming a little bit more common, but it is a hotel or motel conversion to apartments. Um, those are a, a totally different, um, typically business plan, property type, and location um, than your more common, you know, garden style apartments in a great um, suburban metro with good schools and good amenities within walking distance. So, you know, thinking through those different types and those different options of investment is very important to understand because it really drives some of the next things that we're going to talk about as far as your goals and the effort required based on a different asset type. So let's move into, you know, matching your goals with what different investment types are out there. If if you're the person who has a single family investment or a portfolio of single families and um, you, you're tired of you know, trying to track down residents to pay rent or um, you're having issues with tenants being rough on your property, um, maybe your goal is to move into a newer asset um, where there's less maintenance items that you're going to have to fix. And maybe you also want to move into a, um, a higher average rental rate um, to have a different resident renting from you. So all good things to know, I would say for your specific market, talk to a few property managers about what they experience in the marketplace, um, what average rents are for different neighborhoods where you're looking to invest, and talk to them specifically about the time required to invest in each of those specific neighborhoods. So again, if your goal is to um, really get you know, no phone calls, no issues, you probably want to buy a larger, newer apartment community where you can have a full-time management company managing the day-to-day, -day and um, you're really just overseeing and doing the asset management activities. So understanding your goals is really important because you could, um, with with transitioning from single family to multifamily, you could run into a lot of the same challenges um, if you're not careful and if you don't plan out what you actually want to invest in. So let me pause here and see if we have a question in the chat box. Where and how do we find multifamily properties? So, you know, broker relationships are very important in your market. So I would say, you know, speak to a few brokers, speak to some property managers, ask them if they know of any properties for sale. You can also check on, you know, CoStar and LoopNet, but the best, the absolute best way to find properties 
is through a broker relationship. You could also directly contact landlords and owners, um, but it's going to require a high level of effort and you are going to only get maybe one or two deals that way. But having a broker who knows a lot of owners that are interested in selling is going to be probably the best use of your time to find deals that way. Um, the multifamily industry, as we're seeing, you know, even with single family housing, it's competitive. And you are you're going to have to spend time and energy building those relationships or finding deals to get um, to get an investment out there. It's just not going to fall into your lap. So um, again, figure out what your goal is, what you're trying to achieve, and then match the property type to your goal so you're working in the same direction. How to get started with your first multifamily investment. So once you find a great deal out there, you need to have a team around you to help get it done. And I don't, I'm not saying you need to have a partner from the get-go or employees on the team, but you should have the basic team members lined up to help you. And so, you know, you should be speaking to a property manager that's going to help you manage the asset. You should be speaking to some lenders if you're going to finance the acquisition with debt. You should be speaking to a closing attorney who can help you get the property closed and make sure that the property is clear of title issues, um, any sort of environmental issues, any sort of survey or lot line issues, and that the zoning is in compliance. So there's quite a few different moving pieces and parts. It's important to have that team out there. The best suggestion that I have for people who are new to multifamily investing is to network with others in the multifamily investor nation, um, go to the summit, meet new people, and try to have a mentor help you with your first acquisition. Or maybe you give up some of the equity ownership to someone to partner with on your first deal so you can get going and make sure you avoid any major um, challenges that could set you back. It's just, it's much better to, um, to have an expert in your corner kind of guiding you and, and mentoring you through the process if you're new to it. And um, you can get things done a lot quicker and probably do more deals because of that. On the flip side, you can also do the deal completely on your own and learn along the way. Um, use the Multifamily Investor Nation as a resource. Check out all of the videos that we do to know and learn exactly what you're doing at a given time throughout the process. Um, so that's really important. The last thing that I wanted to cover is just keep in mind the level of effort that's required um, based on the different asset types. This is not something that is commonly talked about in the industry, um, but it's important to note that, you know, a, a lot of people take the leap from single family investing to multifamily because they believe multifamily is going to be easier. They're going to save a lot more time and they're really going to have the scalability to operate in an efficient business um, much better on the multifamily side versus the single family side. That is absolutely true. However, you need to understand the level of effort based on different multifamily types. So going back to what we talked about at the beginning, you know, if you're buying a very old property built in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, those properties are, you know, 20 or excuse me, 40, maybe 50 plus years old, there's going to be a lot of maintenance items that can occur. And so you need to be ready for that. You need to have either a full time maintenance person on payroll to manage and oversee that asset. Um, or you need to have a very good plan with your property manager 
to make sure that you can address and repair all of those deferred maintenance items as they come up because an old property will require a lot of day-to-day -day fixes and repairs. So keeping that in mind, if you are buying a property that is less than 100 units, typically um, you might not have a full-time on-site property manager or you may not be able to support a full-time maintenance person on payroll for that property. And so you're kind of put in this predicament, if you're buying a, a 20 unit property or a 50 unit property, um, you're gonna need to spend a lot of time and energy figuring out that maintenance repair procedure, um, which is, is going to be a challenge, not that you can't overcome it, but it is going to be more time. And so that's something to always be thinking about when you're looking at different asset types uh, as to how many units there are and what sort of staffing can a property support. If you're buying a 200 unit property, you're definitely going to have full-time um, staff at the property, which would typically be a property manager, a leasing consultant, a full-time maintenance supervisor, and a full-time maintenance technician. Having all of those folks on site is going to alleviate your effort to manage the day-to-day -day issues that come up with the property. And so that's where the scalability and the efficiencies come in as opposed to having a bunch of single family assets out there. Um, another important key in terms of level of effort required for multifamily, having excellent property management will make or break your business plan and the performance of an asset. And so it's really important to know going in, if, if you're planning to self-manage, um, you're going to have a high level of effort required to do the management. If you're going to outsource and hire a property management company to oversee the property, that's great. You're going to need to, again, spend some time and effort making sure that the management company is adhering to your pro forma, your budget, your goals, so everyone is working in the same direction. So um, just because you want to make the leap from single family to multifamily and uh, be a little bit more passive, um, it's not always the case, again, depending on what property type you're buying, where it's located, and what your management philosophy is um, around that. A lot of folks have had great success in, you know, buying uh, you know, several single family homes, selling all of them off, and then rolling all of that equity into buy one new larger apartment community. Um, it's a great strategy to have. You just need to think through what you're going to buy, what your level of effort is going to be, because it's still going to be required. And then, you know, how do you successfully manage it and do the asset management for that project? That being said, let me pause for a minute, catch my breath, and see if there are any questions. Feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A box, and I will be more than happy to answer as many questions as we have here. I'm surprised no one has a question of making the leap from single family to multifamily. Don't be shy. Ask your question in the chat box. You can even send it to, um, to just myself privately if you want, um, or to the host as opposed to everyone out there. So go ahead and, and do that. Use the Q&A box, use the chat box. I didn't really have much else to cover on today's webinar. We talked about making the leap from single family to multifamily. We talked about the different multifamily types. We talked about the importance of your goal matching with the investment you're trying to make. Uh, we talked about getting started, having the team around you. And then we talked about the level of effort. So let me jump to a couple of questions 
and uh, we will go from here. So feel free to use the um, chat box and I will answer, like I said, as many as I can. What is a good size building for the initial leap when switching over? So when you are trying to make the leap from single to multifamily, um, I like to say that you have to, again, match your goal with the investment. So if you absolutely love working with residents and managing properties, then you could definitely go out and buy several 10 unit multifamily properties and love what you do every single day. Um, if you are trying to scale up to reduce the amount of time necessary, then you may want to look for, you know, any property type that is 50 units or larger. The other important thing when thinking about sizing up um, or making the leap to multifamilies, you need to remember how much of a property can you afford. So let's say you are you own 10 single family houses and you own them with straight up cash, you have no debt on them, and you're going to sell all of the properties, all 10 today for 100000 each. That's going to put a million dollars of equity in your pocket. And let's say you don't want to have any investors. You want to buy your first multifamily property on your own. Well, what size deal can you buy with a million dollars in equity is the question you need to ask, um, which will help determine how many units you can be looking for or what type of property you can find. So with a million dollars in cash, I would say you could probably afford to buy a property that is somewhere between five and seven million dollars. I'm sorry, somewhere between three to four million, depending on what type of debt you're going to get. Um, typically, Loans today are about 70% LTV. So if you buy a $3 million property, 30% of 3 million is 900,000. And that means 900 of your million is going to go at closing and you're going to have 100,000 left in the bank for operating reserves, getting started, maybe some CapEx to it. And so... You have to think about, you know, sizing of the property, both from a unit perspective, but also an equity perspective. If you have only a million dollars to go out and buy a property, you should not be looking at a $20 million apartment community if you are trying to do the deal completely on your own. So that would remove a huge number of deals to look at. So you're only looking at deals that fit your criteria. So again, if the maximum purchase price you can afford is $3 million, figure out how many units that can be for your area or based on the type of property. And it's going to help you look for specific deals that fit your needs, your goal um, versus other folks who may be different. Um, can you re-say the team that you would need with 200 units? So the property um, staffing would typically be uh, a property manager on-site full-time, a leasing agent or consultant, a uh, maintenance supervisor and a maintenance technician. Typically you'd have about four people full-time working there Monday through Friday, um, even having some weekend coverage. So that would be the, the staffing for a 200 unit typically. Um, George, I'm not sure I understand your question about a master lease 
Uh, so if you have a question about that, maybe repost that. Um, thoughts on the first deal being 20 or 40 or a hundred plus units, you know, I think you can go as big as you want, Dan, I would say, again, think about your personal goal, um, potentially the bigger, may be better. It may be more efficient, but you also need to keep in mind how much can you afford to buy today? And, um, you know, people always need to get started typically, a little bit smaller and then kind of grow from there. So, you know, if you can't quite afford a hundred unit deal today, maybe you buy a 50 today and the next deal you do is a hundred because you've grown um, based off your experience. Um, how do you get one-on-one -on -one networking? Um, it's been challenging during COVID. So, you know, I would check out the multifamily investor nation. I would get looped in with local real estate investors where you live, meet with people, do coffee, do virtual meetings, um, and um, always, you know, check out other one-on-one -on -one coaching programs if that's something you're interested in, but always ask around and, and meet some uh, folks locally to see what they are doing. And that would be a good way to get a one-on-one -on -one mentor. If we do an asset-based loan for a multifamily, how much money would be the down payment or renovations? Um, I think I answered that one, John, with my example of typically 70% LTV. And you're going to need some extra for renovation or CapEx. Now we've really got some questions coming in here. So this is excellent. Um, what if you're new and want to move directly into multifamily? Absolutely. You can go straight into multifamily without doing single family. Same principles apply. Understand your goals. Understand how many units you can afford, what the purchase price is, and then go and do it. And ideally, um, you might have a mentor guide you or partner with you on that first one so it can go smoothly. If goal is not lots of property management and want scalability, okay, so financing, um, there's plenty of lenders out there that will work with first time folks. Um, typically in the multifamily space, a lender is going to want you to have a lot of experience or a, um, a net worth equal to the loan amount and typically 10% of the liquidity. So if you're trying to get a loan for a million dollars, they are going to want to see that you have a net worth of 1 million or greater and that you have $100,000 in liquidity sitting in like a checking account, a savings account, or a stock investing account, something that can be liquid in a matter of moments. Um, if you don't have those things, then that's where you may need a partner to join you either with experience or with the net worth and the liquidity to help get you financing. But go out, have some conversations with local community banks, have conversations with larger brokers and see what financing options they have and kind of what they recommend um, to get you into that 75 plus unit. Uh, where can I go to determine how good a local area market is for rentals? You know, this is, um, this question is really more subjective to what criteria you have for investing. So, you know, uh, demographic information is important from like a population growth perspective, a job growth perspective, and, a you know, school district rating amenities close by. So, uh, you know, speak to some brokers, speak to some local investors and see what areas they like and, and why. And um, that'll kind of drive you there. How much should you budget for closing costs? 
typically closing costs are going to be somewhere to around um, around one to two percent of the purchase price as a rule of thumb. If you are getting into a deal and you're buying it for a million dollars, um, your closing costs may be somewhere around, you know, 10 to um, $30,000, depending on transfer taxes, title costs, third party reports, legal fees. And so a lot of these costs can be estimated prior to getting a deal under contract. So if you don't know what you should budget for, um, check out our underwriting videos, but also talk to some folks who have done deals in the market you're trying to buy in and see how much those transfer taxes are. There's a lot of um, local government fees that change from market to market. So it's important to know that, but you can get estimates um, right now today without having a deal under contract even. Um, cost efficiencies with four full-time team would reach how many units? Um, you know, typically four full-time team members working on site could probably handle, I would say 250 units. And then maybe once you get to 300 units or more, you might need another maintenance person and another leasing person, but that's just a rough rule of thumb. What are recommended resources to learn about the commercial real estate industry um, before you make the leap I hear an abundance of acronyms and financing on the webinars. It's different from residential. Absolutely. Um, check out all of our videos. So, you know, we have a ton of different videos that really go through every single phase of the multifamily investing process. Um, not only on the finding deals on the acquisition side, but also on the closing of deals, the underwriting of deals, working with investors if you want to do that. So take some time to do that. Um, and that would probably be the best resource. Uh, networking with other folks locally um, who are into commercial real estate is another good way, just so your ears are constantly hearing some of these acronyms and different things. Um, is it realistic to locate a seller who might allow a master lease to put your efforts in place for a time before you purchase? Uh, George, it's certainly possible. I would just say it's going to be a ton of effort. So you can certainly do it and make it work. But with today's market being so competitive, um, sellers are probably less likely to let you run their property um, in the event that something were to go wrong or you screw things up, then they wouldn't be able to sell it for as much as they could versus, you know, if a seller puts a property on the market today, they'll probably have multiple offers. And so if they truly want to have their money, um, they'll probably take a different offer as opposed to your master lease, but it's certainly possible. Um, last question in here. If the goal is to buy and hold, but you need investors, how do you structure a deal um, for investors? Marty, I would say check out some of our capital raising videos. We also have very good deal structuring videos that really go through the ins and outs of how to structure a deal for investors. So that's a, a much deeper um much deeper answer required than I can really give you in this time, but we've got some excellent videos that talk about how to structure deals, how to work with different investors. And so um, those would be a good um, resource for you. Um, that being said, thank you everyone for all of your questions. Let me check this chat box here one more time. Um, if you have any more questions, um, please let me know. What's the most EMD you have had to put up 
and go hard on a deal? Oh, good question. Um, we have done in excess of seven figures, so over a million dollars in hard money um, on a deal day one to get some of the institutional quality assets that we buy. Again, typically earnest money deposits are somewhere around one to 2% of the purchase price. And so earlier this year, we acquired a $90 million plus property. And so um, we had some pretty significant hard money um, on that deal. But, you know, talk to brokers in your market, see what types of uh, things are common for the deals that you're going after and, and make sure you have that EMD money ready to go and available so you can win a deal. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Um, next week's webinar is going to be covering how to accept international investors into your apartment syndication. So um, I know some of you are asking about um, investors and next week we're gonna talk about international investors. So if you have friends um, from out of the country, you can absolutely get them into your deal and we'll talk about that next week. So make sure you sign up for that webinar. Melissa, thank you so much. You've posted the link for everyone to go ahead and register for next week's MFIN webinar. Um, glad everybody could join today. Uh, Dan, thank you for the shout out. Glad you appreciated the insights that I shared. Again, we don't know it all. We just share what we, we can with y'all. And um, check out some of our other videos, ask questions, interact on the forums, interact in the Multifamily Investor Nation group. And we will see you next week for the international investor conversation. And I'll answer this last question. I am a new realtor to South and North Carolina. What and where should I go to network? Um, check out the Multifamily Investor Nation. Reach out to some folks who invest in South Carolina and North Carolina and get involved with some local investor meetups and groups um, so you can get engaged um, with some local folks. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a great morning, a great afternoon, or a great evening, um, wherever you're joining us from. And we will catch you next week for accepting international investors into your apartment syndication webinar. Thank you.